A minute ago, I talked about extra biblical texts. I like to call these the synchronized, biblically endorsed extra biblical texts. These uh, texts that you, have, you see up there, the book of Enoch, the book of Joshua, and the book of Jubilees, actually tell a very, very detailed story about what's going on in Genesis 6. And they all sync up with each other perfectly. They, they all tell the same story in the same chronological order of events. And when you put all four together, these three extra biblical texts, as well as the, the canonized scripture, Genesis chapter 6, it tells you a very detailed story, each book filling in a little bit more of the blanks. And so uh, as we go forward in this teaching, I'm going to make references to uh, these three books as well as to the scriptures themselves. I call them synchronized because they do sync up with each other. I call them biblically endorsed because the Bible itself, I'm not going to argue whether or not these are canon. I'm not going to go there. The Bible itself endorses these by quoting them. Jude basically cut and paste entire sentences and put it in his kind of short little freaky book. <laughs> Jude's a pretty wild little book, and, and a fair amount of it's coming right out of the book of Enoch. And how many of you believe that the Bible, the, the canonized scripture, is divinely inspired by the Holy Spirit? And we read that in the Bible, right? That, that, that uh, men wrote, but the Holy Spirit inspired them to do so. So under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, God told the author of Jude, yeah, go ahead and quote, quote the book of Enoch. Uh, and I would submit that Moses was probably aware of it as well when he's writing the Torah because you get six chapters into the first book of the Bible and he throws a word out like Nephilim and doesn't give any further explanation for it. Because everybody just, oh, okay, yeah, we know what the Nephilim are. Yeah, sure. Well, how'd they know that? There had to have been some other source for them to be aware of. Uh, and in the case of like the book of Joshua, it's actually mentioned by name twice, two witnesses, right? In the canonized scripture, in the book of Joshua and 2 Samuel, it is mentioned by name. In, in Joshua, that one's really interesting because that's a story where Joshua commands the sun to stand still, right? That's a pretty far out story when you think about it. Because that means the earth stopped rotating. <laughs> the sun stood, you know, stood still in the sky. It means the earth stopped rotating. Well, the way it's written in Joshua, it says, is it not written in the book of Joshua that this happened? Well, that's like using that other book for credibility. Because everybody, well, we all know Joshua's true. I mean, that's the way it's, it comes across. So, uh, again, if it's good enough for the, the uh, scriptures to endorse it, I say, let's go ahead and look at it. Same with Jubilees. There's other references to the Bible that come from the book of Jubilees. So that's why I call them biblically endorsed. Uh, I'm not going to base any doctrine, especially anything that has to do with salvation. I'm not going to base any of doctrines on extra biblical texts. I'm going to stick to the canonized text. But I'm going to look at these to color the text a little bit for historical value. If it um, goes along with scripture, great, wonderful. We get added detail. If it conflicts with scripture, throw it out. Simple as that. That's just the way I look at it. Uh, so we'll be looking at some of those books. You notice the title, Archon Invasion, The Return of the Nephilim. So, so let's start off with who or what is an archon? <laughs> uh, we've got a scripture here, Ephesians chapter 2, wherein time passed, you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, Ephesians 2.2. 2. That word there, prince, is archon in Greek. It's a, a masculine noun. It simply means chief, ruler, uh, prince, leader, commander with authority. In the book of Enoch, we find that there are 20 named archons. There are 20 individuals named as the chief princes or leaders over the 200 watcher class angels that landed on Mount Hermon in the days of Jared. So we could think of these as, as leaders uh, and, and sort of like the generals in charge, so to speak. So that's what an archon is. Now, how many of you think we're in the last days or coming pretty close to it? I do. And this scripture really stands out to me when I think about that. Where Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. And if we all agree that we may be getting pretty close to the coming of the Son of Man, then we've really got to take a look at the days of Noah. And as I started to do that, uh, one of the things that jumped out at me was the fact that Noah lived for 950 years. And most of the time we say Noah, and the first thing we think of is Noah's Ark. And that's about the extent of it. You know, we don't really think too much past that. But the reality of it is he lived 600 years before the flood and 350 years after the flood, and a whole lot of weird and wild and crazy things happened on both sides of the flood. And Jesus said, take note of that because some of that stuff's going to happen again. Uh, some, if not all. Uh, I'm going to talk about what I call the Genesis 6 experiment. The Genesis 6 experiment is essentially summed up in Genesis 
chapter 6, verses 1 through 4, I've got 1 and 2 listed here, where it talks about the fact that the sons of God came unto the daughters of men, and there they bear children to them. Now, we see in the synchronized extra-biblical text support for that. We see that in Genesis 6, it calls them the sons of God. In 1 Enoch, same thing. It's interesting that it actually syncs up to the exact same chapter and same two verses, Genesis 6, 1 and 2, as well as 1 Enoch 6, 1 and 2. Genesis calls them the sons of God. Enoch calls them the angels or the children of heaven. And Jubilees chapter 5, verse 1, calls them the angels of God. So here we see clearly that we're talking about angels, not the sons of Seth, as is taught in many seminaries today. I think that whole theory is completely absurd and unsupported, so I'm not going to spend any more time talking about it. But we see in the synchronized extra-biblical text, as well as the scriptures itself, that the sons of God is a reference to angels. In fact, if we go outside of that and just go into the historical documents, uh, I've never heard a pastor, theologian, teacher, evangelist who hasn't at some point in his career referenced the works of Josephus to give support for what is in the scriptures. And his, Josephus was a first century historian, uh, well-respected historian, and he comes right out and tells you the same thing, that it's angels that we're talking about. Uh, he writes about that in Antiquity of the Jews. The New Testament refers to them as the angels that sinned. In 2 Peter 2, 4 and 5, it talks about the angels that sinned, that they are bound in chains of darkness. And I, I like the way Peter actually writes this. It, he, he says that they are uh, were cast down to hell in many of your translations. But in Greek, the word is Tartarus. Uh, and if I'm not mistaken, I think that's the only time that word is used in Scripture. Uh, I could be wrong, but I think that's the only time. What's interesting about Tartarus, if you, many of you went to, how many of you went to public schools? Uh, even if you didn't go to public schools, you may have read the Odyssey, the Iliad, some of the Greek mythology. All right, and that's kind of mandatory these days in, uh, in secular school. Um, that's where the Olympians put the uh, Titans, they, they bound up the Titans in the prison of Tartarus. It's the lowest level of Hades. We see the same thing in Jude, verse 6. The angels which kept not their first estate were kept in everlasting chains of darkness, okay? And in Jubilees, chapter 5, verse 6, we have a, a, a parallel scripture there, or writing, if you prefer, talking about the angels being bound in the depths of the earth, and look, they are bound in the middle of the earth. Now, God's judgment against these angels that sinned is given in quite a bit of detail in the book of 1 Enoch. And it talks about a couple things here I want to focus on. It says that their offspring, okay, these would be the first generation Nephilim. Uh, it says in the bold there, for length of days they shall not have. And no request they make of thee shall be granted unto their fathers, which would be the watchers, on their behalf. For they hope to live in eternal life. And that each one of them, that being the Nephilim offspring, will live for 500 years. So God's setting an age limit for the first generation Nephilim. They're only going to live for 500 years. And the Lord said unto Michael, go bind some Jaja. He's one of the archons. He's the leader of actually the leaders. He's the, he's the head archon, if, if you prefer, uh, some Jaza. Go bind some Jaza and his associates who have united themselves with women so as to have defiled themselves with them in all their uncleanness. And when their sons, that would be the first generation Nephilim offspring, have slain one another and have seen the destruction of their beloved ones, bind them, being the watchers, fast for 70 generations. Keep that in mind. 70 generations these guys are bound. In the valleys of the earth till the day of their judgment and of their consummation till the judgment that is forever and ever is consummated. Okay, so we find in, in the book of First Enoch that... The first generation Nephilim were only going to live 500 years, and they were to kill each other off in that time. They're, God was going to basically cause a civil war where these guys are going to fight and kill each other off, and the watchers, their parents, are going to be made to watch their beloved ones die. How many of you would like to see your kids massacred? Anybody? No, of course not. Nobody. Well, neither did they. That was part of their judgment, was to watch their beloved children be massacred before they were put in chains of darkness in Tartarus. There's a DVD that I produced last year called the Mount Hermon Roswell Connection. And in that DVD, I detail five reasons why I do not believe that there was a second incursion of fallen angels. This is one of those areas where I differ from my colleagues that study this. Most people that I know who study the Nephilim believe that there was what's called a second or multiple incursions. Incursions being the act of angels mating with women. They think that it happened in Genesis 6 and it continued to happen after the flood again and again and again based on their view of Genesis 6-4, which we'll talk about some more uh, shortly. I disagree with that. 
Uh, remember when I talked about the, the uh, details that I try to hold myself to? One of the things is confirming scriptures. I can find zero confirming scriptures for their view of Genesis 6-4. If angels made it with humans again, the scriptures should have told us so. Not only is it not in the Bible anywhere that angels ever made it with humans again, it's also not in the synchronized extra-biblical text. Biblically endorsed extra-biblical text. <laughs> so here are the five reasons. The judgment against the watchers was extremely severe, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in this presentation as well. That's one of the reasons why I don't believe angels made it with women again. Two, again, like I just said, there are no confirming scriptures for their view of Genesis 6-4 in the repeat incursion theory. Three, size began to drop dramatically. The book of Enoch says in chapter 7 that the uh, first generation Nephilim got as tall as um, 3,000 L's. 3,000 L's, according to Dr. A. Nyland's uh, translation of the book of Enoch, is equal to 300 cubits. 300 cubits is 450 feet. Interesting thing about uh, that number, 300 cubits, is that's the same dimension as the length of the ark. So I thought, wow, isn't it interesting? Uh, here it is in Enoch chapter 7. And the women became pregnant, and they bare large giants whose height was 3,000 L's, or 300 cubits. We have a hard time imagining a 450-foot tall giant. It's inconceivable. Greeks didn't have any problem with it, though. They called them the Titans. I'm just throwing it out there. That's what the text says. Take it for whatever you want. In the post-flood world, however, the Bible does give us some detail about how tall the giants were. And at max, the most you could get is maybe 150 feet. I think is more likely 35 feet, and we'll talk about that in a minute, based on Amos 2.9 and a few other things, like in Numbers 13 and some of the things that are described there. So we went from, theoretically, 450 feet to 35 to 150 feet. Size dropped dramatically for Nephilim in the post-flood world. The world should have become completely corrupted five times over. Genesis 6.12 says that all flesh had become corrupted as a result of what happened in the pre previous verses of Genesis chapter 6. Okay, so, and best of my calculations, the uh, first generation Nephilim, the days of Jared, the incursion that took place on Mount Hermon in the days of Jared, happened roughly 3550 B.C., and I base that on, and I'll show you a timeline in a minute, on the works of Dr. Ken Johnson, Bishop Usher. There's a lot of other people that have put together timelines based on the genealogies given in Scripture. Based on the genealogies given in Scripture, uh, if that's true, if the first incursion was 3550 B.C., then they were on the earth, the Nephilim were on the earth in one form or another for 1,200 years up to the time of the flood. And in that time period, they were able to completely corrupt all of God's creation. Well, they've had five times as many time periods to do so. If they could completely corrupt all of God's creation in 1,000 to 1,500 or 1,200 years, they've had 5,000 years to do the same thing. How come we're still here? No, I don't believe there was a second incursion. And why science instead of sex? And that's what I detail in this particular DVD, is all accounts of abduction and things like that. So you've got, you see an alien gray there. I think that's just repackaged Genesis 6 activity. That's what I think all that is. Uh, but you don't see that these entities are having sex, you see that they are extracting seed, they are extracting eggs, they are doing scientific experimentation to create embryos and things like that. So why all that? Why go through all the laboratory experiments if all you had to do is have sex? Doesn't make any sense. So I don't believe, these are the five reasons I don't believe there was a second incursion or multiple incursions. God's severe judgment. I told you I'd talk a little bit more about that, so let's get right into it. Do angels tremble at the judgments of God? Some of my colleagues would say no. And they would base that on the fact that look at how much evil is happening in the world and look what the demons are doing and, and the fallen angels are doing in the world today. God doesn't seem to, you know, he's, he doesn't seem to do much about it. You know, he, he allows them to do that. That's, that's their argument. Um, that may be true. They, they know that the lake of fire is waiting for them at the end of everything. Uh, but this judgment, God appears to be putting, uh, drawing a line in the sand. He's allowed them for whatever reason, in God's sovereignty, he's allowed them to do what they do in the world today. But he draws a line in the sand when it comes to mating with his creation. He says, if you're going to mate with my creation, here's the judgment. And it's extremely severe. First Enoch chapter 6, verse 2 through 4. And the angels, the sons of heaven, saw and lusted after them, and they said to one another, Come, let us choose us wives from among the children of men and have children with them. And Samjaza, who was their leader, said to them, I fear, so they do fear, you will not agree 
to do this deed, and I alone shall have to pay the penalty for this, what does it say? Great sin. So here we see that the leader of the 200 watchers was fully aware that they were about to commit a great sin. But they went ahead and did it anyway. They took a mutual oath. They said, no, we're all in. We're, we're with you. We're going to do it. In fact, the reason Mount Hermon is called Mount Hermon is because of the mutual oath. Apparently, the word Hermon or Homon, however you pronounce it, uh, has something to do with uh, taking an oath, apparently. Uh, that's why they call it Mount Hermon. So they all went ahead and did it. Then the judgment that they feared was imposed upon them. Enoch chapter 13, verses 3 through 4 says, Then I went and spake to them all together, and they were all afraid, and fear and trembling seized them. Yes, angels do fear. And they besought me to draw up a petition for them, that they might find forgiveness, and to read their petition in the presence of the Lord of heaven. For from thenceforward they could not speak with him, nor lift up their eyes to heaven, for shame of their sins for which they had been condemned. Let's go on. This is Enoch, 1 Enoch chapter 68. On that day, Michael answered Raphael and said, The power of the Spirit grips me and makes me tremble because of the severity of the judgment of the secrets and the judgment of the angels. Who can endure the severe judgment which has been executed and before which they melt away? And Michael answered again and said to Raphael, Who would not have a softened heart concerning it? And whose mind would not be troubled by this judgment against them because of those who have led them out? So here we see both good and bad angels terrified of the severe judgment that comes from mating with human women. Now watch this. 1 Enoch chapter 68 verse 5 says, Therefore, all that is hidden shall come on them forever and ever. For no other angel or man shall have his portion in this judgment, but they alone have received their judgment forever and ever. Michael is prophesying that no other angel will ever be judged for this act again. Based on the context of the previous chapters and verses, the reason is because the hosts of heaven, both good and bad, saw how severe that particular act of disobedience was judged by God. God would not be just if he did not impose the same exact judgment on any other angel who committed the same act of sinning against his creation. We know that God is just, right? So he wouldn't be just if he just imposed this judgment on these 200 but didn't do it for any other angels. He would have to impose the same judgment on anybody that did it. So here we see that all the angels, good and bad, are terrified of this judgment, and Michael himself prophesies that no other angel is going to participate in this. So <laughs> I believe there's abundant evidence that there was not any other incursions. Now, I've drawn up a little bit. Uh, I'm a visual person, so I like to depict things in charts and things like that, so I can look at them vi visually. Here you see what I said earlier, the Genesis 6 experiment uh, happening at roughly 3550 BC. And we see the first generation Titans, uh, Nephilim, were to rule for 500 years, and in that time period, they were to kill each other off. And right about in the middle of their reign there, Enoch is born. And then you see some really interesting things start to pop up toward the end of the 500 years. You see, first of all, the uh, Aztec calendar stone, the Mayan calendar, pops up in 3114 BC, shortly before they are the end of their time period. Then you see the death of Adam shortly thereafter. The, the first man on the planet dies, and roughly 20, 25 years or so after that is the end of the first generation Nephilim. The 500 years comes to an end roughly 3050 BC, 500 years later. That's in Enoch chapter 10, verse 10. Then, we, at some point immediately afterwards or shortly thereafter, the watchers, the parents, were judged and buried and put in Tartarus. And then shortly after that, Enoch is raptured. And then roughly 65 years or so after that, Noah is born, and his daddy calls him Rest. Interesting. We'll look at the names uh, a little bit more closely in a few minutes. From that point on, there is no further written documentation of any other incursions of angels mating with humans in the Bible or in the synchronized, biblically endorsed, extra-biblical text. Neither are there any angels mentioned in the favorite scripture of my detractors, who will take the after that of Genesis 6-4 and apply it to Numbers 13-33. And there we saw the Nephilim, the sons of Anak, who come of the Nephilim. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. So I put a little six-footer there next to a 36-footer, and it's pretty easy to see why they would have viewed themselves that way. I mean, think about it. That big guy there would have looked at the six-footer, well, a little grasshopper, I squash you like a bug. <laughs> you know? And the other guy like, man, I feel like a grasshopper compared to that guy. Right? Uh, just take the scriptures for what it says. I mean, why do they describe it that way? 
Well, I believe that's why they describe it that way. But you notice it says the Nephilim were the sons of Anak. Anak is a descendant of Canaan, not a descendant of angels. And it says right there, these Nephilim came of Nephilim. They came from Nephilim. It doesn't say they came from fallen angels. So again, I don't believe in the multiple incursions theory. There's no reason to believe in it. And Dr. Michael Heiser, even though he still believes, he's, he's another uh, scholar uh, that researches this stuff, he still believes, for whatever reason, in the multiple incursion idea, but he acknowledges that there really is no reason to do so. Listen to what he has to say about the breakdown of the Hebrew of Numbers 13.33. You also have a problem with the repeat transgression. I'll be honest with you. I favor this view, but Numbers 13 might be a problem with it, and this is something I still need to think through very plainly says, we saw the Nephilim. Now watch this. Here's one spelling. Right here, the little letter. And here's the other one. We saw the Nephilim, ha Nephilim there. The Anakites are from the Nephilim. This phrase, from the Nephilim, is min ha Nephilim. You'll notice there's no yod here. You have the same word spelled two different ways. I think the reason why this is done here is because this is the way it's spelled in Genesis 6. The writer wants to link these Nephilim after the flood with the ones before the flood. And if that's the case, if the Anakim came from, in other words, were related to the Nephilim from before the flood, you don't need the continual cohabitation. You have a genetic relationship intact, so to speak. You do indeed have a genetic relationship intact, so to speak, and you have no need for a repeat incursion to justify the giants after the flood.